Hello and welcome to another episode of Virtual Legality. I'm your host, Richard Hogue, managing member of the Hogue Law Business Law Firm of Northville, Michigan. And even though yesterday was a day that we purportedly caught up with Epic versus Apple, every day is a new day in the world of antitrust and competition law, and today is no different. On your screen right now is a post from Spotify, streaming music purveyor extraordinaire, entitled Consumers and Innovators Win on a Level Playing Field. This is dated March of 2019, so actually predates the Epic lawsuit and Epic's moves against both the Google Play Store and the iOS, but I think you'll find some similarities. As we look at this blog post, Spotify has filed a complaint against Apple with the European Commission, EC. In recent years, Apple has introduced rules to the App Store that purposely limit choice and stifle innovation at the expense of the user experience, essentially acting as both a player and referee to deliberately disadvantage other app developers. Apple is both the owner of the iOS platform and the App Store and a competitor to services like Spotify. In theory, this is fine. But in Apple's case, they continue to give themselves an unfair advantage at every turn. To illustrate what I mean, let me share a few examples. Apple requires that Spotify and other digital services pay a 30% tax on purchases made through Apple's payment system, including upgrading from our free to our premium service. If we pay this tax, it would force us to artificially inflate the price of our premium membership well above the price of Apple Music. And to keep our price competitive for our customers, that isn't something we can do. As an alternative, if we choose not to use Apple's payment system, foregoing the charge, Apple then applies a series of technical and experience limiting restrictions on Spotify. For example, they limit our communication with our customers, including our outreach beyond the app. Indeed, all of the things that Spotify has mentioned in this blog post from 2019 are things that we have gone over before in our discussion of Epic versus Apple. We aren't seeking special treatment, says Spotify. We simply want the same treatment as numerous other apps on the App Store like Uber or Deliveroo, who aren't subject to the Apple tax and therefore don't have the same restrictions. What we are asking for is the following. First, apps should be able to compete fairly on the merits and not based on who owns the App Store. We should all be subject to the same fair set of rules and restrictions, including Apple Music. Now, first question, of course, is what does that look like for Apple Music? They could charge themselves 30%, but it's still ultimately the same coffers. And of course, the question is then arisen about other walled gardens. When Sony takes 30% of a cut from an electronic arts game sold on their platform, should they take a 30% cut from Returnal or Ratchet and Clank when it's sold on their platform? I wouldn't think so. And certainly the consumers wouldn't appear to be benefited by that. Although a consumer could look at something like a Returnal and say, hey, it's still being sold at $70, even though there isn't this middleman fee, shouldn't I get a discount on a game like that? Indeed, if you look at the history of the video game industry, a lot of the times first party games were sold at a discount. Ratchet and Clank games, in my recollection, were often sold at $40 rather than $60 when that was the primary price point, but the market will bear what the market will bear. So it's a little unclear what Spotify is asking for here, and it's a little unclear how Apple would deliver it and what impact it would have on the other members of both the video game industry and more broadly, the technology industry in general. Second, consumers should have a real voice of payment systems and not be locked in or forced to use systems with discriminatory tariffs such as Apple's. So this language that we saw in the Coalition for App Fairness, which we will of course discuss as part of this video, was being trial ballooned, tested, even earlier than I had originally thought with Spotify here, using phrases for what are fairly standard retail-like commissions as taxes and tariffs because they have negative connotations. And hell, for rhetorical devices, they make a lot of sense to put forth in a system like this one to say you should feel negatively about those things. Finally, app stores should not be allowed to control the communications between services and users including placing unfair restrictions on marketing and promotions that benefit consumers. And again, we go back to Epic versus Apple, where we've talked about this issue before. And the question, of course, is if you're selling a game at Best Buy, if you're putting a movie up on a Target shelf and that movie purveyor wants to put up a sticker that says you could buy it here or you could buy it for 50% off over on our own website, should Target or Best Buy or Apple have to put that on their store shelf, digital or real? 
And historically, the answer to that question has been no, that if you control a store shelf, you control what goes on it. You can enter into freely arranged contracts and determine amongst the two parties what belongs on that shelf. And consumers can understand that there are different places to buy different goods and services at different prices, which is why Walmart can sell the same thing at a different price than the Target, because sometimes you go and you price match and you shop for different goods in different places. But... Even though this might all sound very, very familiar to you and the 33 videos currently in the antitrust epic playlist, and even though you might say, hey, that also sounds like what the Coalition for App Fairness is talking about, which of course is made up of companies like Basecamp and Epic Games and scrolling a little farther, I believe this is alphabetical order, Spotify, and you might say, Rick, you know, I'm not sure that that's the greatest argument, but we're going to find out as we go through the Epic versus Apple litigation starting next week. Enter the European Union. As The Verge reports, European Union accuses Apple of App Store antitrust violations after Spotify complaint. Apple faces fines as high as $27 billion. Now, backing up a step. The European Union and their quote-unquote competition law is not the United States and our quote-unquote antitrust law. They are based on different premises, based on different statutes, based on different concepts. And the European Union has historically been more aggressive in policing its competition provisions than the United States has been. As we've talked about in our playlist here, the United States often changes its antitrust focus depending on presidential administrations. And so it's very difficult to actually say what's going to happen in any case in antitrust law in the United States, including in the upcoming one that starts next week. Obviously, we've talked about it at length, and I've got my issues with Epic's theory of the case, but Epic's theory and Spotify's theory are very, very similar. Or as one of the commissioners of this particular group says, in Twitter form, our preliminary conclusion, Apple is in breach of European Union competition law. Apple Music competes with other music streaming services, but Apple charges high commission fees on rivals in the App Store and forbids them to inform of alternative subscription options. Consumers losing out, which of course is the name of this particular video, what I put in the thumbnail. And the question always is, are consumers losing out from the activity of the market participants or are consumers losing out from the regulatory authorities? And let's discuss what those regulatory authorities found about this particular arrangement. The European Commission has informed Apple of its preliminary view that it distorted competition in the music streaming market as it abused its dominant position for the distribution of music streaming apps through its app store. That part highlighted in red and the part in white about the app store is one of the major questions at the heart of Epic versus Apple. Is there a viable competition market, an antitrust market in United States parlance that can be described as access to Apple's own iOS ecosystem? And one of the things that I've stated is historically in the United States, at least a single product controlling access to that product through rules, contractual or otherwise, is not usually an antitrust market, that Apple gets to control access to its iPhone, that Sony gets to control access to its PlayStation, Microsoft to its Xbox, etc., etc. What the European Union has preliminarily found here, and this is not the end of this discussion in the European Union, it is in fact the beginning of the formal process, is that Apple has a dominant position of the distribution of specifically music streaming apps because it was brought to the EU's attention by nature of that Spotify complaint through its app store. The commission takes issue with the mandatory use of Apple's own in-app purchase mechanism imposed on music streaming app developers to distribute their apps via Apple's app store. And the commission is also concerned that Apple applies certain restrictions on app developers, preventing them from informing iPhone and iPad users of alternative, cheaper purchasing possibilities. Apple is a monopolist in iOS app store access. It requires them to use the in-app payment processing mechanism with its 30% excise tax as described by Spotify and also prevents Spotify and other music streaming services from telling folks that they can get the service cheaper elsewhere. And that is the crux of the Epic argument. As the executive vice president here says, app stores play a central role in today's digital economy. We can now do our shopping, access news, music or movies via apps instead of visiting websites. In fact, the market has been pretty good at bringing that 
particular product and service to bear for consumers and, as the European Union says here, for consumers' benefit. That said, our preliminary finding is that Apple is a gatekeeper to users of iPhones and iPads via the App Store. Good luck winning that argument, Apple. I think you could probably concede that you are, in fact, a gatekeeper to users of your phones and iPads that you sold. Your problem is whether or not that's a viable market, either under American or European law. With Apple Music, Apple also competes with music streaming providers. Indeed, they do. By setting strict rules on the App Store that disadvantage competing music streaming services, Apple deprives users of cheaper music streaming choices and distorts competition. Now, understand what that says. They have a commission that they charge for people that have access to their store and their millions and millions and millions of eyeballs that own an iPhone or an iPad. That's not altogether unusual in a marketplace. In fact, just like the other retail options that we talked about at the top of this video, it is standard for each layer of a transaction going from production to consumer to take a cut. That's how you incentivize the various logistical capabilities that get that product ultimately into a consumer's hands. So it's a little bit unusual from my perspective to look at what is being said here, what is being claimed by Epic and saying, yeah, maybe 30% is too high if you want to fight about the number. But this doesn't talk about the number. This just talks about the existence of of a number that makes the price go up. And indeed it does. Just like when you're buying from a wholesaler, you can get something cheaper than buying it from a retailer because the retailer is doing something to get it in front of you. And indeed, if you go back and you look at the preliminary injunction directive from the judge in Epic versus Apple, or even the temporary restraining order level, you see the judge grappling with this under American law saying, well, Apple is providing something like marketing. It's providing store shelf space, even if it's ephemeral, even if it's digital, shouldn't they get something in exchange for that service that they're providing? The European Union comes in here and actually calls that into question. They don't talk about the number specifically at 30%. They talk about the fact that the price goes up because somebody is taking a cut in the interim regardless. And that's going to be interesting because the European Union does take these aggressive tax. This is done by charging high commission fees on each transaction in the app store for rivals and by forbidding them from informing their customers of alternative subscription options. The commission preliminarily finds that Apple has a dominant position in the market for the distribution of music streaming apps through its app store. Apple's devices and software form a closed ecosystem in which Apple controls every aspect of the user experience for iPhones and iPads. The commission found that users of Apple's devices are very loyal to the brand and they do not switch easily. And this is one of those things that if you're in antitrust, you're looking for, because one of the things that is designed to say that you've got this dominant position is the friction, the stickiness, the costs of moving between brands. And so this finding that Apple fans like Apple products is essentially supposed to be bad for Apple. Of course, from my perspective, you can easily turn it on its face and say, yes, Apple fans like Apple devices for a specific reason. They like Apple's business model. They like what they get when they purchase an Apple product. And you, European Commission, would seek to upend that and to change it and make it something that I, as a consumer, don't like nearly as much. It's the same conversation we've had throughout the entirety of the Epic versus Apple case. Continuing with what the commission has found here, the commission's investigation showed that most streaming providers passed the 30% commission fee, which they thankfully don't call a tax or a tariff as Spotify did in their complaint. And they pass that fee on to end users by raising prices. Indeed, that is in general how a market works. When you've got interim fees imposed by a retailer or a platform provider like Apple, that does get passed along either in whole or in part. One of the issues, though, of course, as we've talked about in our own playlist, is whether or not that number comes down when that interim fee comes down. The Epic Game Store has existed now for a couple of years, charging only 12% to developers and publishers for the games made available on that platform. And we don't actually see, from a scientific perspective, looking at the numbers across Steam and across GOG and across a lot of other places, including the Epic Game Store, that those end user prices come down. Now, the European Union and Commission, although they say consumers losing out, seems a little bit less inclined to judge this solely on the consumer welfare standard that really does drive antitrust law in the United States. So they might take a broader approach and say, well, we are going to protect Spotify here, even if we don't have the ability to show that prices will come down in the absence of this 30% or in a reduction of the 30%. But still, Apple, you're doing bad things. 
While Apple allows users to use music subscriptions purchased elsewhere, its rules prevent developers from informing users about such purchasing possibilities, which are usually cheaper. Indeed, they do, as we talked about earlier in this video. But what's interesting about this kind of finding, and even the Spotify complaint itself, where they say they don't want to be treated differently, is one option for Apple to meet the rhetorical argument there is to say, okay, we won't treat anybody differently. We won't have music services on our phone. Or if we do, you won't be allowed to sell subscriptions elsewhere if you want access to our iOS. And does that make it better for you? Does that make it better for consumers? Is that fairer? It's more even, but does it actually help people that want to get onto Spotify? And that's a question that the European Union, the European Commission, Apple et al. will have to ask. Sending a statement of objections and opening of a formal antitrust investigation does not prejudge the outcome of the investigations. This is just the first formal step into suspected violations of EU antitrust rules. So the European Union has entered the fray. A new challenger has arised. And yet one of the things that I wanted to bring up as part of this discussion, not just to inform you that this happened this morning, that the European Commission is now talking about potentially fining Apple on the eve of that Epic versus Apple case, and Epic will undoubtedly bring it up in the trial to come starting next week, but also that Epic is not in control of this movement, of this discussion, even of the Coalition for App Fairness. If we go and we look just a couple of hours ago, we see on PC Gamer a description of a lawsuit. Overgrowth developer Wolfire Games files antitrust lawsuit against who? Against Valve. The suit says Steam suppresses competition and takes an extraordinarily high cut from developers. Wolfire Games, the developer of Overgrowth and Receiver, has filed an antitrust lawsuit against Valve, alleging that it uses its dominance over the PC gaming market through Steam to suppress competition while it extracts an extraordinarily high cut from nearly every sale that passes through its store. Sound familiar? That means not only forking over a 30% cut of all sales, unless they make over $10 million, but also agreeing to restrictions on pricing that ensure that other storefronts are unable to compete on price. Valve can and does, according to the suit, prevent developers from setting lower prices on non-Steam storefronts and from selling Steam keys at lower prices through other distributors. Now, the Steam key issue is far more complex than that. Go look up keys on this channel in virtual legality. You can see a couple of videos that I've done on how the Steam rules, the terms and conditions, how they use their keys, how it doesn't quite mean what a lot of folks think it means. Check that out because this lawsuit is probably going to come up against conversations like that in front of a judge or even a jury, depending on how it goes. In Wolfire's estimation, that sucks for game makers. Probably not how they described it in the lawsuit, but will allow PC Gamer the poetic license. In order to afford Valve's 30% commission, game publishers must raise their prices to consumers and can afford to invest fewer resources in innovation and creation. Gamers are injured by paying higher retail prices caused by Valve's high commissions. Competition, output, and innovation are suppressed in ways that can never be fully redressed by damages alone. Again, we have the same conversation here as we do in the rest of Epic versus Apple and the European Union and Commission, which is to say, making something costs money. The same sentence here that says, well, if I have to spend 30% on Valve, players have to spend more on paying for my game in order for me to get a cut, could be levied at every point in the process. I had to spend money on billboards. I had to spend money on Unreal Engine. I had to spend money on middleware. I had to spend money paying for janitorial staff. Every little thing that you do to raise the cost of operations to get a product out to market could have this same sentence levied at it. And I don't see that particular item being levied at the antitrust laws of the United States or the European Commission. And I do think it's worth noting that if you're providing a service of some kind, and that service can be, I've got 100 million users that regularly come and check out what's on my store shelves, then in general, in any aspect of competition law or antitrust law, you're entitled to some recompense for the thing that you have built. The lawsuit claims that Steam's domination of the market can be seen in the fact that no other storefront, including those operated by deep-pocketed heavy hitters like Electronic Arts and Microsoft, have been able to make meaningful headway against it. And indeed, that could be evidence of an intractable market share. However, it's also worth noting, it could be evidence of a platform that people like, that provides features that they want. And yes, it's hard to fight against something like that because people already like it. If you're going to build a theme park right next to Disney World, High Universal, you're going to have to do extra stuff and try extra hard to get people away from a brand that they already love. 
If you're Epic Games opening up your competitor to Disney World next to Steam, you're going to have to try extra hard to get people away from that thing that they already love. This lawsuit apparently also brings up problems with exclusives and how that indicates that Steam is a market dominant force. The release of Borderlands 3 is enabled for the EGS platform rather than the Steam gaming platform, for example, triggered a backlash among some gamers with reactions, including calls for boycotts, YouTube rants, conspiracy theories, and review bombing. It states one user started a petition on the Reddit slash gaming online Reddit community. That user argued, we can't just let Epic Games keep buying out exclusives to their expletive launcher. This is very anti-consumer and it is literally Epic paying millions to 2K just to expletive over us, the buyers. I really suggest everyone on PC to boycott the game until it releases on Steam so Epic does not get any of our money. And again, that's a consumer that enjoys a specific platform saying exclusives are anti-consumer, which in general, they are, of course, and acting against that. And that is being used in this lawsuit to prove that Steam is somehow acting illegally by taking its cut. So when we have the conversations about Epic versus Apple, when Epic comes out and says, well, I don't intend to attack these other platforms. I don't intend to come after the Sony PlayStation, the Xbox, the Nintendo Switch, other things that you might otherwise like. Understand that when you've got arguments that are brought before the European Union with some success, when you've got arguments that people take up in a lawsuit like Epic versus Apple, that the litigants themselves, the plaintiff in this case, don't have control over how those arguments are used. If Epic wins the case against Apple, and there's a non-zero chance that they might, even though historically Apple has the better, the stronger part of the argument here, then don't be surprised if that's spun around and used in all jurisdictions of all types against a lot of the things that you otherwise love and think should be allowed to charge the rate that they're currently charging in order to function as a viable ecosystem. And lest we think that Tim Sweeney, righteous as he is, is doing this just for other developers and for the greatness and nobility of his cause, he put paid to that lie on Twitter himself when talking about these very issues in a tweet that follows. If Steam committed to a permanent 88% revenue share for all developers and publishers without major strings attached, Epic would hastily organize a retreat from exclusives while honoring our partner commitments and consider putting our own games on Steam. This is, has been, and always will be a play from competitors to these platforms to get their charges lowered. And there is nothing wrong with that. If you're in a business selling apps or games, then yeah, absolutely. Use the forces at your command to try to get your costs lowered, but don't pretend that it's anything else. European Union, Steam, Xbox, Apple, everybody else is on notice that this is gonna be a wild time for the video game and other technology industries and all started by a couple of app publishers that really, really, really wanted to improve their already multi-million, if not billion dollar bottom line. This has been Virtual Legality for today. If you enjoy talking about the business and law of video games, music, movies, television, pop culture, and of course, big technology, please consider supporting the channel. We've got a Patreon, Streamlabs donations. We've got a store or above all else, just consider subscribing, ringing the bell, upvotes, downvotes, comments, anything that can help Google notice that we're here on YouTube. And of course, most importantly, telling your friends that we're having this conversation. If you saw this on YouTube, thank you so much for watching. And if you listen to it as a podcast, thank you so much for listening. And I will catch you on the very next episode of Virtual Legality. Virtual Legality is a YouTube video series with audio podcast versions presented as commentary and for education and entertainment purposes only. It does not constitute legal advice and does not create an attorney-client relationship. If you have legal questions about the topics discussed, please consult your own legal counsel.